welcome to our evening remembering Bante. And um, I'll, I'll say a bit more detail about what we're going to do. I'm not going to be saying too much, but um, just to let you know the broad outline of the evening first. And that is, we'll be in here, we'll be having a session that has, as you can see, cellos and readings. It's going to be really enjoyable. Uh, and then um, we'll have a tea break, there'll be tea and cake outside, and then there'll be a puja to, uh, in the second half, Abhay and Andy will be leading us. I'm co-organising and leading this evening with Abhay and Andy. So, yeah, we're here to remember Bante, and four it was four years ago today when we heard that Bante Sangharapshita, the te a teacher and the founder of this order and this movement, had, had died, and people instinctively flocked into the shrine room uh, on that occasion. Does it feel like four, year, four years? Does that feel a long time or a short time? To me, I was thinking it feels like there's been a long time. Mm. Yeah. And, and I'm surprised it's not more than four years because when somebody dies or some other big significant event, it often marks a new moment, doesn't it, in your <coughs> sense of what time is. And, the, and it's, But it was a huge marker for us collectively a huge event, and anyone who went to the uh, the funeral will, you know, that was indelibly printed in my mind as a, as a one-off. Um, it wasn't a, an event that was, it didn't feel very sad, it felt joyous, it felt, well, it felt unlike any other event I've ever been to, so, but it's been four years, so we're, we're performing an act of remembrance this evening, we're just coming together to remember Bante, the, the man, and, and who he was to us. And we thought it would be a, a lovely thing to do to hear some of uh, Bhante in his own words. Um, Maitre Bandhu and David Gosha put together a collection of, of uh, Bhante talking about himself and they were kind enough to let us delve into that collection for this evening. So everything you'll hear this evening from our readers, Nyanavarcha, Vishpantara and Pranimanas will be words from Bhante about himself roughly chronologically through the different phases of his life. So what we're going to do is, we're going to hear this uh, a cello duo. So we've got Anna and Randa Najoti um, doing an improvised cello duo. Uh, and they'll be responding to the reading. So we'll have you don't really have to worry about this, you just have to sit there and enjoy it. And I'm not going to labour the point about what we're going to do, but it, the readings will probably themselves last for about 25 minutes, and the cello pieces as well, I'm not quite sure, they're improvised, so they could. But it's, uh, yes, yeah, so just going to really enjoy hearing Bante in his own words, and then hearing the cellos, which are, the cellos speak, don't they? I think for all instruments, they, they have that quality of speaking. Um, so I won't, I won't go through the whole thing. Um, you can just enjoy it. Um, so really make yourselves comfortable. Well, I think we can start by saluting the shrine. Namo Buddhaya. Namo.
As I grew older, I naturally became dissatisfied with passive contemplation. Mother, can I go out to play? was my constant cry. The natural playground of the London child is, of course, the street. But there I was not allowed to play until after I had started school. In the meantime, therefore, I played on the black and white tiles of the porch and behind the dusty privet with my sister, Joan, 15 months younger than myself, and a girl of my own age who lived up the street. Sometimes we played so noisily that the lady downstairs had to tap gently on the window of her front room to quieten us. When it rained, or when I was not allowed to play out in the front, my refrain was, Mother, can Frances come in to play? Usually she could. Our favourite indoor game was dressing up, for which we ransacked the house for old lace curtains. As a special treat, we were sometimes allowed to borrow the embroidered veil in which Father and I had been christened. And then great was our joy, for instead of playing mothers and fathers as we usually did, we could play at weddings. In my case, this love of dressing up persisted much longer than it did with the girls. And even at the age of eight, I could spend hours in front of the wardrobe mirror, experimenting with different styles of dress. Jersey and knickerbockers were not my real costume, I felt. And almost desperately, I swathed and draped myself in lengths of material, searching in vain for my true vesture. The only times I felt satisfied were 
when, with the help of a red ensign, I achieved a toga-like effect, which, though not <coughs> exactly right, was, to some extent, what I desired. Gravely holding grandfather's silver-mounted amber cane, I would then stand, gazing at my reflection with solemn pleasure. I have more than once reflected that the two years I spent confined to bed, alone with a few books and the children's encyclopedia, must have had a decisive influence on my character and thus on the course of my whole life thereafter. Until then, so far as I know, I had been just an ordinary boy, indistinguishable from other working class tooting boys. Like them, I loved playing in the street, was not particularly fond of school, got into scrapes and fights, and was overjoyed when I could go fishing with my father on a Saturday afternoon. The discovery that I had heart disease put a stop to all that. From a lively, occasionally naughty eight-year-old, I was transformed overnight into a bedridden invalid who was scarcely permitted to move his arms freely. Abruptly and drastically, the current of my youthful energies was dammed and redirected. Strange to say, I cannot recall ever, ever resenting this or even feeling frustrated or restless. Perhaps I was sedated. I may even have been quite happy in, an, in a way. Yet such a lengthy period of enforced immobility could not but have affected me radically. From a distance of more than 60 years, I can see it as having affected me in at least three ways. It forced my energies inwards towards the world of thought and imagination, making me more introspective than was normal for one of my years, or than I probably was by nature. Then, the fact that I was scarcely permitted to move my arms freely meant that I was obliged to be conscious of what I was doing. That was even more the case when I came to graduate at the end of the two years from bed to wheelchair, and when, later still, I started using my legs again. There was always a voice in my ear, my mother's or father's, warning me to be careful or not to move so quickly, and I may have ended up internalising that admonitory voice. This constant need to be aware of what I was doing had both a positive and a negative effect. While it made it easier for me years later to cultivate the Buddhist virtue of mindfulness, whether of bodily movements or mental states, it also tended to check my any spontaneous physical expression of my feelings. Finally, my confinement to bed not only cut me off from contact with boys of my own age, but made me feel separate and different. This feeling of separateness and difference persisted after my eventual return to school, for I was not allowed to take part in games or to play with my schoolfellows. How big is God? This was a question that perplexed me when I was a child, and I thought about it from time to time. I had probably been told about the greatness of God at Sunday school, and was thinking that great meant big. I tried to imagine how big he was. From the way this greatness was described, 
I concluded that God was not only very big, but that he possessed, moreover, a giant human form. I therefore tried to imagine an enormously big foot, <laughs> no doubt thinking that with this as a starting point, I could work my way up to an idea of just how big God really was. <laughs> Although bigness and greatness are not synonymous, it is certainly possible for the former to suggest or symbolise or shadow forth the latter, so that I was not entirely on the wrong track when, as a child, I tried to ascertain how big was God. I was not on the wrong track because I had, even at that age, an obscure sense of something not merely greater than me, but immeasurably higher in the scale of existence. This sense has always been strong in me, and as I grew up, it became increasingly focused on the person of the human, historical Shakyamuni, the Buddha, or Enlightened One.
Whether the intensity of my enjoyment of music contributed to my first mystical experience, which came at about this time, I am, I am unable to say. But a Beethoven overture, or a symphony by Mozart, used to affect me so powerfully that for several days I would hear the music ringing again and again <coughs> in my ears. So intense, indeed, would my concentration on these inner sounds be, that not only did they sound as loud and clear as when I had heard them with my physical ears over the radio, but I would practically lose consciousness of my body. This state of semi-trance, which music sometimes induced in me, seemed to be of the same order as the two experiences which, appropriating a conveniently vague term, I have called mystical. Both occurred several times. The first had indeed come to me, though not very intensely, even before my evacuation during the war. Like most of my other mystical experiences, it is associated in memory with the place at which it occurred. One day, on my way to the Tooting Public Library, I, as usual, had to cross the road at Amen Corner, so called because in ancient times, when the choir of the parish church performed the annual ceremony of beating the bounds, they broke up at this spot, which marked the boundary of the parish, with a loud Amen. As I crossed from one side of the street to the other, I suddenly awoke to the complete absurdity of the mind being tied down to a single physical body. Why could I not look through at the look at the world through the eyes of the man standing on the opposite pavement? Why could I not know his thoughts as easily as I knew my own? As these questions flashed upon me, I felt my consciousness desperately struggling to free itself from the body and project itself into all the bodies walking round Armen Corner. Though its efforts were unavailing and it sank back exhausted, I thereafter had a feeling of being imprisoned. When, years later, I read in the Surangama Sutra, a famous text of Buddhist idealism, the dialogue in which the Buddha makes his disciple Ananda realise, step by step, that his consciousness is neither inside his body nor outside it, nor yet somewhere between, being in its true nature universal, I felt I was treading on familiar ground. The other experience was even more striking. As I was walking down the main road towards Tooting Broadway, it suddenly seemed as though I was moving in a world of ghosts. The whole street, with its houses, shops and people, suddenly receded into the infinitely remote distance. The roar of the traffic faded into an intense silence. My own body felt light, airy, insubstantial, and it seemed I no longer walked on the solid pavement, but floated, clearly conscious, <coughs> through an immense void. This void was simultaneously coterminous with my own consciousness, so that it also seemed that I was floating through myself. Though this experience, which was much more vivid than the first, generally lasted for the time it took me to walk a hundred yards. <coughs> its after-effects persisted much longer. For upwards of an hour, the objective world, though again visible, seemed strangely unreal, as if it had no business to be there, and might disappear at any second. Since I suffered from valvular disease of the heart and was still supposed not to run or even to walk quickly, I had assumed that I was quite unfit for military service. At my medical board, however, I was classed as B2, while the cardiologist to whom I was referred at my request told me that there was nothing wrong with my heart. Thus, from being an outsider who could not even run quickly, I was transformed overnight into an insider who, with two or three dozen other men, was drilled, went on route marches 
and learned to handle a variety of lethal weapons. In the Rainbow Road, the chapter in which I described my early days in the army is headed The Misfit. In a sense, we were all misfits, having been plunged into the army from various walks of life and at various ages, from 18 to 45. Though I did not realise it at the time, we were comparatively lucky. We were lucky because on the strength of our knowledge of Morse code, we had been posted to a semi-secret unit of the Royal Corps of Signals and had to undergo only the most basic military training. Even so, after four or five months, it became evident that the authorities wanted to get us off military training and into full-time technical training as quickly as possible. No more drill, no more guard duty, and no more route marches. And we were given as many weekend passes as we wanted. In this more civilised atmosphere, tensions relaxed, and we were able to take up the thread of interests that we had had to drop on entering the army. In my own case, I had more time for walks in the countryside, and for reading and writing poetry. Nor was this all. Living at close quarters with other men, especially those of my own age, I became more aware than ever that I was an outsider. I was not an outsider because I loved the poetry of Robert Herrick, or was exhilarated by Nietzsche's Thus Spake Zarathustra, or even because I regarded myself as a Buddhist. I was an outsider for deeper and darker reasons. I was an outsider because I was sexually attracted to men, not to women, and I had been aware of this since the age of 14. Know thyself was the injunction of one of the sages of ancient Greece, an injunction that was also inscribed on a pillar in the temple of Apollo at Delphi. But neither in the ancient nor in the modern world has it ever been easy for a man truly to know himself. At the time that I was staying at Burma Raja's guest cottage and becoming better acquainted with such traditions and individual talents as were represented in the little town of Kalimpong, <coughs> I was still far from knowing myself. In particular, I was far from knowing the extent of my own capabilities. This was in part due to circumstances. Having spent much of my childhood as an invalid, and my three years in the army doing work for which I was quite unsuited and which I cordially detested, I had come to think of myself as an essentially impractical kind of person whose real interests and real life lay in a completely different world. Like Baudelaire's albatross, I felt at home in the sky more than on a ship's deck even though my wings were as yet far from being fully developed. This impression of myself as lacking in practicality had been reinforced during my two years as a wandering ascetic. Satyapriya, the companion of my wanderings, was an exceptionally active and capable person, with more than a touch of the, de of the desire to lead and to dominate. He it was who took all the decisions and made all the practical arrangements, leaving to me the role of admiring spectator of his energy and ability. The contemplation of my impracticality in comparison with his own extreme competence indeed gave him a pleasant sense of superiority. <laughs>
I had never seen an image of Padmasambhava before, perhaps not even a painting. As I entered the temple, all the greater was the shock, therefore, when I saw in front of me, three or four times larger than life, the mighty, sedent figure of the semi-legendary founder and inspirer of the Nyingma Pa tradition, a skull cup in his left hand, a staff topped with skulls in the crook of his left arm, and the celebrated wrathful smile on his moustached face. All this I took in instantly, together with the lotus hat, the richly embroidered robes, and the much smaller flanking figures of his two consorts, one Tibetan and one Nepalese. Having taken it in, I felt that it had always been there, and that in seeing the figure of Padmasambhava, I had become conscious of a spiritual presence that had, in fact, been with me all the time. Though I had never seen the figure of Padmasambhava before, it was familiar to me in a way that no other figure on earth was familiar. Familiar and fascinating. It was familiar as my own self, yet at the same time <coughs> infinitely mysterious, infinitely wonderful, and infinitely inspiring. Familiar, mysterious, wonderful and inspiring it was to remain. Indeed, from then on, the figure of the precious Guru, Guru Rinpoche, was to occupy a permanent place in my inner spiritual world, even as it played a prominent part in the spiritual life and imagination of the entire Himalayan region. At ten o'clock one evening, having finished my meditation, I opened my eyes to find myself surrounded by seven or eight tall black figures. I was sitting cross-legged at the back of the hall, in the left-hand corner, and the figures stood round me as though in a semicircle of light. They were six or seven feet tall, naked, and as it were, tubular in shape, being uniformly not more than 10 or 12 inches wide. What was more remarkable still, each of the figures possessed a pair of enormous white saucer eyes, and with these eyes, they were all looking down at me. Their whole appearance and attitude, but particularly their eyes, were expressive of an indescribable mournfulness, of an infinite hopelessness and sadness such as I had never seen, and which I had never imagined could exist. How long we remained looking at each other, I do not know. Perhaps it was five minutes, Perhaps it was half an hour. Eventually, as the effect of the meditation started wearing off, I began feeling slightly uneasy. Rising to my feet, I walked straight through the figures and out onto the little veranda in between our room and the storeroom on the courtyard side of the ashram. It was absolutely dark. Satchapriya was still meditating in the shrine behind the grill's doors. Shankara Pillai, I knew, was doing something in the kitchen. After remaining on the veranda for a couple of minutes, I returned to the hall, sat down in my corner and looked. There was nothing there. 
Later, I concluded that the figures I had seen must have been those of pretas or hungry ghosts, a class of beings who, according to traditional Buddhist cosmology, inhabit one out of the five or six spheres of conditioned existence, the others being occupied respectively by gods, titans, animals, tormented beings, and men. Though I did not know it at the time, I ought to have spoken to the praetors and asked them what the matter was and whether I could do anything for them. To discover one's true parents is to learn something about oneself and to discover a whole series of previously unknown ancestors is to learn even more and to learn it with greater certainty. The basic fact about my Lingwood ancestors was that they were farmers. Generation after generation they had ploughed, sowed, harvested and gathered into barns. Farming was therefore in my blood, along with other ingredients, and it was natural that when, in a foreign country, I acquired a stone cottage and four acres of hillside land, I should have cultivated those four acres as a matter of course. During the seven years that I lived at the cottage, I grew maize and buckwheat, cared for my hundred orange trees, and saw to it that there were vegetables for the table and flowers for the shrine. There were good practical reasons for my doing this, but I did not do it only for these reasons. I also did it because engaging with the soil gave me a deep inner satisfaction. It was the kind of satisfaction that Edward Lingwood of Battisford must have experienced when carting barley a hundred years earlier. Thank mm -hmm. you.
My friendship with Terry was soon disembarrassed of any remnants of formality, due partly to his strict and repressive upbringing. Terry, in any case, tended to dislike formality, preferring that human relations should be conducted on an informal basis. This did not mean that he treated people casually, much less still took liberties with them, but only that he sought to relate to them simply as fellow human beings rather than in accordance with their social or economic position. Me, he never treated as a monk in the way others did. The fact, that I, the, the fact that I wore a yellow robe and was head of the English Sangha meant nothing to him. He even took to addressing me not as Bante or your reverence, as everybody else at the Bihara and the Buddhist society did, but by my Christian name, a fact that scandalised one or two good lay Buddhists when they came to know of it. I did not mind him addressing me in this way. Had he thought I minded, he certainly would not have done so. Even though I had never liked my Christian name and had been glad when eventually it was superseded by a Buddhist monastic one. Indeed, I rejoiced that such a degree of intimacy and mutual confidence could exist between us and that I was in contact with at least one person who was able to relate to me not as layman to monk, or even as disciple to master, but as friend to friend, in the highest and fullest sense. We even talked of one day working together, though it was difficult for us to imagine what form this would actually take. Terry had his job, and a seven-year-old daughter whom he saw every other weekend. I had the incumbency of the Hampstead Buddhist Vihara, as well as my work in India, especially among the newly converted ex-untouchable Buddhists. For the time being, therefore, we collaborated just intellectually and spiritually, by way of our late night discussions, and did what we could for each other in small practical ways. Terry was particularly anxious to be of service to me as a designer and as the driver of a Volkswagen caravan, and towards the end of July, I was able to afford him the opportunity of functioning in both these capacities. For a considerable period prior to 1970, I had been overwhelmed by a feeling that words had no meaning whatever. It was not simply that they were imprecise or clumsy or inept to express eternal verities, but quite literally that they were devoid of any meaning. Besides making the writing of letters virtually impossible, this feeling made it difficult for me even to speak. When asked a question about, for example, Buddhism, I would see quite clearly that the question was utterly meaningless, that in reality nothing had been asked at all, and that all that had happened was that, activated by certain psychological conditionings, someone had produced a series of completely meaningless sounds. During 1970, however, this feeling of the meaninglessness of words diminished in intensity. Or perhaps I was able to cope with it better. Dear Paramatha, you left last Thursday and that night I had a dream. I dreamed about my auntie Kate she was my mother's elder sister, and when I was very young, I often stayed with her in the rather dark upstairs flat in Fulham, where she lived with Uncle Dan. 
She was extremely fond of me, even though I was very naughty, pulling out her long hairpins when she had her afternoon nap, or even tying her to the back of her chair. <laughs> Far from minding, she would only laugh at my tricks. She was indeed extremely fond of me, and I was extremely fond of her. The dream was quite a short one. I was in my mother's room, waiting for the arrival of Auntie Kate. The room was small and comfortably furnished like a small nest, and there were colourful rugs on the floor. It was not like any room that my mother had actually ever occupied. In the dream, as in many other dreams, I was of no particular age and I was not doing anything. I was simply waiting for the arrival of Auntie Kate and listening for her step on the stairs. <coughs> I eventually heard it. The door opened and in walked Auntie Kate. She was no bigger than a very small child and I had to go down on the floor so that we could embrace each other. It was an intensely emotional occasion for both of us. I then woke up. The dream was fled, but my heart was still filled with love for Auntie Kate. <coughs> Thank you. You will agree that it was a strange dream, and I cannot think what might have occasioned it. Though I have dreamt of my mother a number of times, this was the first time I had dreamed of Auntie Kate. And why did she appear in the dream as a small child? The only connection I can make between the dream and a recent happening in my waking life is one that concerned Malika, though admittedly it is a rather tenuous one. I had recently been told that 85-year-old Malika was planning to move from Bethnal Green to Aberdeen in order to be near her youngest daughter, even though the move would mean leaving behind all her Sangha friends, some of whom had been helping her for years. The words that came to my mind when I heard of this were, the leaves return to the tree. In other words, when we suspect that we may not have much longer to live, we often feel a strong urge to return to our place of origin. Malika was of Scottish origin, and perhaps it is not surprising that she should want to go back to Scotland and be near her daughter. My own place of origin was South London, I having been born in Stockwell and brought up in Tooting. Though I am unaware of any urge to go and spend my last days in South London, <laughs> in recent years I have often dreamt of standing and waiting for the Tooting Broadway bus or underground train. Sometimes it would arrive, sometimes not, and I would be left waiting. I have also dreamt that I was sitting in the Tooting Broadway bus and looking out of the window as I waited for the bus to arrive at its destination, where I got out and started walking towards my old home. In some dreams that home would be associated with my mother. In one such dream I was walking home with her and on the way we stopped at a pub where she had a meal before we continued on our way. In a more recent dream, I was with a group of friends and I was anxious because I had promised my mother to be back by eight o'clock and it was now 9.30. I would have to get a taxi, I said. Whereupon, you stepped forward saying, don't worry, I'll drive you to your mother's place. On this occasion, as so often in real life, you were there when I needed you. I have never found it difficult to look up 
As a boy, I looked up to such heroes as Alfred the Great, Robin Hood, and Sir Walter Raleigh, as well as to the gods and heroes of ancient Greece and Scandinavia. Later on, I was to enjoy Carlyle's heroes and hero worship, though not all his heroes were mine. In my teens, I discovered the painters, sculptors and architects of the Italian Renaissance, some of whom seemed to tower above ordinary humanity. I also discovered the great poets and playwrights of my own country, as well as its great prose writers of both sexes. To all of these I looked up with admiration, wonder and delight, rejoicing that such individuals had lived and worked among us and that the products of their genius were still available to us. It was in my teen years, too, that I extended my horizon beyond Europe to take in the wise men of Asia, and especially the Buddha, whom I came to see not just as a historical figure, but as the embodiment of ultimate reality. I came to look up not only to the Buddha and to his Dharma and his enlightened disciples, but also to those religious geniuses who in India, China and Tibet had helped to bring out the significance of certain aspects of his teaching. Nearer home, I looked up to, and still look up to, my personal teachers, honouring and respecting them as best I can in my own life and teaching. I look up to Jagdish Kashyap, who taught me Pali and Abhidharma. I look up to Chatral Sangye Dorje, who gave me the Green Tara initiation. I look up to Kachu Rinpoche, who gave me the Padmasambhava sadhana. I look up to Jamyan Kense Rinpoche, who initiated me into the sadhanas of Manjigosha, Avalokiteshvara, Vajrapani and Green Tara. I look up to Dudjong Rinpoche, who initiated me into the Vajrasattva sadhana. I look up to Dado Rinpoche, who initiated me into the White Tara Sadhana and gave me the Bodhisattva precepts. I look up to Dilgo Kyense Rinpoche, who introduced me to the Yellow Jambala, to White Tara and to Kurukula. To Gogi Chen, too, I look up, who shared with me the treasures of Vajrayana and Chan. I look up to all these compassionate teachers whose influence has entered into my life and has through me entered into the life of the Tri Ratna Buddhist order. To them do I look up with devotion and endless gratitude.
please do join us in 20 minutes or so for a good job. Hello, welcome back everybody. <laughs> Um, just before we start the Sevenfold Puja, I, I wanted to say thank you very, very much to, um, yeah, to Anna and Vandana Jyoti for you know, beautiful playing, and also to our readers, um, Inyana Varcha, Vishvantra, and Pranimanas. That was really beautiful. Thank you very much. Um, oh yes, and also uh, do help yourself to cake on the way out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah. So we'll be doing a sevenfold puja in honor of Bante Sangratita, and um, yeah, just in the in the usual way. Um, there'll be a mantra after the worship section. There'll be re a reading after entreaty and supplication. We'll do the Heart Sutra together, and um, we'll end with the closing mantras. Oh, thank you. And we'll start by saluting the shrine. Namo Buddhaya Namo Buddhaya Namo Dharmaya Namo Sevenfold Puja. Worship. With Mandarava, Blue Lotus, and Jasmine. With Mandarava, Blue Lotus, and Jasmine. With all flowers pleasing and fragrant. With all flowers pleasing and fragrant. And with garlands skillfully woven. And with garlands skillfully woven. I pay honour to the princes of the sages. I pay honour to the princes of the sages. So worthy of veneration. So worthy of veneration. I envelop them in clouds of incense. I envelop them in clouds of incense. Sweet and penetrating. Sweet and penetrating. I make them offerings of food, hard and soft. I make them offerings of food, hard and soft. And pleasing kinds of liquids to drink. And pleasing kinds of liquids to drink. I offer them lamps encrusted with jewels. I offer them lamps encrusted with jewels. Festooned with golden lotus. Festooned with golden lotus. On the paving sprinkled with perfume. On the paving sprinkled with perfume. I scatter handfuls of beautiful flowers. I scatter handfuls of beautiful flowers.
salutation. As many atoms as there are, as many atoms as there are, in the thousand million worlds, in the thousand million worlds, so many times I make reverent salutation, so many times I make reverent salutation, to all the Buddhas of the three eras, to all the Buddhas of the three eras, to the Siddharma, to the Siddharma, and to the excellent community, and to the excellent community. I pay homage to all the shrines. I pay homage to all the shrines and places in which the bodhisattvas have been. And places in which the bodhisattvas have been. I make profound obeisance to the teachers. I make profound obeisance to the teachers and those to whom respectful salutation is due. And those to whom respectful salutation is due. Going for refuge. This very day. This very day. I go for my refuge. I go for my refuge. To the powerful protectors. To the powerful protectors. Whose purpose is to guard the universe. Whose purpose is to guard the universe. The mighty conquerors who overcome suffering everywhere. The mighty conquerors who overcome suffering everywhere. Wholeheartedly also I take my refuge. Wholeheartedly also I take my refuge. In the Dharma they have ascertained. In the Dharma they have ascertained. Which is the abode of security against the rounds of rebirth. Which is the abode of security against the rounds of rebirth. Likewise in the host of bodhisattvas. Likewise in the host of bodhisattvas. I take my refuge. I take my refuge. The refuges and precepts in unison. Namo tassa bhagavato arhato sama sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arhato sama sambuddhasa namo Oh, uh-huh. 
satisfy my body. With truthful communication, I purify my speech. With mindfulness clear and radiant, I purify my mind. Confession of faults. The evil that I have heaped up. The evil that I have heaped up. Through my ignorance and foolishness. Through my ignorance and foolishness. Evil in the world of everyday experience. Evil in the world of everyday experience. As well as evil in understanding and intelligence. As well as evil in understanding and intelligence. All that I acknowledge to the protectors. All that I acknowledge to the protectors. Standing before them. Standing before them. With hands raised in reverence. With hands raised in reverence. And terrified of suffering. And terrified of suffering. I pay salutations again and again. I pay salutations again and again. May the leaders receive this kindly. May the leaders receive this kindly. Just as it is with its many faults. Just as it is with its many faults. What is not good, O protectors? What is not good, O protectors? I shall not do again. I shall not do again. Rejoicing in merit. I rejoice with delight. I rejoice with delight. In the good done by all beings. In the good done by all beings. Through which they obtain rest. Through which they obtain rest. With the end of suffering. With the end of suffering. May those who have suffered be happy. May those who have suffered be happy. I rejoice in the release of beings. I rejoice in the release of beings. From the sufferings of the rounds of existence. From the sufferings of the rounds of existence. I rejoice in the nature of the Bodhisattva. I rejoice in the nature of the Bodhisattva. And the Buddha. And the Buddha. Who are protectors. Who are protectors. I rejoice in the arising of the will to enlightenment. I rejoice in the arising of the will to enlightenment. And the teaching. And the teaching. Those oceans that bring happiness to all beings. Those oceans that bring happiness to all beings. And are the abode of welfare of all beings. And are the abode of welfare of all beings. Entreaty and supplication. Saluting them with folded hands. Saluting them with folded hands. I entreat the Buddhas in all the quarters. I entreat the Buddhas in all the quarters. May they make shine the lamp of the Dharma. May they make shine the lamp of the Dharma. For those wandering in the suffering of delusion. For those wandering in the suffering of delusion. With hands folded in reverence. With hands folded in reverence. I implore the conquerors desiring to enter nirvana. I implore the conquerors desiring to enter nirvana. May they remain here for endless ages. May they remain here for endless ages. So that life in this world does not grow dark. So that life in this world does not grow dark. One night I found myself, as it were, out of the body, and in the presence of Amitabha, the Buddha of infinite light, who presides over the western quarter of the universe. The colour of the Buddha was a deep, rich, luminous red, like that of rubies, though at the same time soft and glowing, like the light of the setting sun. While his left hand rested on his lap, the fingers of his right hand held up by the stalk a single red lotus in full bloom, and he sat in the usual cross-legged posture, 
on an enormous red lotus that floated on the surface of the sea. To the left, immediately beneath the raised right arm of the Buddha, was the red hemisphere of the setting sun, its reflection glittering golden across the waters. How long the experience lasted I do not know, for I seemed to be out of time as well as out of the body. But I saw the Buddha as clearly as I had ever seen anything under the ordinary circumstances of my life, indeed far more clearly and vividly. The rich red colour of Amitabha himself, as well as of the two lotuses and the setting sun, made a particularly deep impression on me. It was more wonderful, more appealing than any earthly red. It was like red light, but so soft and at the same time so vivid as to be altogether without parallel. In the course of the next few days I composed a series of stanzas describing the vision. Contrary to my usual practice, I failed to write them down afterwards with the result that they gradually faded from my mind. But the experience itself never faded. Nearly a quarter of a century later, the figure of the Red Buddha is as clear to me in, reflec in recollection as it was the next morning in the Virupaksha Guha. Heart Sutra in unison. The Bodhisattva of Compassion, when he meditated deeply, saw the emptiness of all five skandhas and sundered the bonds that caused him suffering. Here then, form is no other than emptiness, emptiness no other than form. Form is only emptiness. Emptiness only form. Feeling, thought and choice, consciousness itself, are the same as this. All things are by nature void. They are not born or destroyed, nor are they stained or pure, nor do they wax or wane. So, in emptiness, no form, no feeling, thought or choice, nor is there consciousness. No eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind. No colour, sound, smell, taste, touch or what the mind takes hold of. Nor even act of sensing. No ignorance or end of it nor all that comes of ignorance, no withering, no death, no end of them, nor is there pain or cause of pain, or cease in pain, or noble path to lead from pain, not even wisdom to attain. Attainment too is emptiness. So know that the Bodhisattva holding to nothing whatever, but dwelling in Pranya wisdom, is freed of delusive hindrance, rid of the fear bred by it, and reaches clearest nirvana. All Buddhas of past and present, Buddhas of future time, using this Pranya wisdom, come to full and perfect vision. Here then the great Dharani, the radiant clearest mantra, the Pranya Paramita, whose words allay all pain, hear and believe its truth. Gate, gate, paragate, arasangate,
transference of merit and self-surrender. May the merit gained in my acting thus go to the alleviation of the suffering of all beings. Go to the alleviation of the suffering of all beings. My personality throughout my existences. My personality throughout my existences. My possessions. My possessions. And my merit in all three ways. And my merit in all three ways. I give up without regard to myself. I give up without regard to myself. For the benefit of all beings. For the benefit of all beings. Just as the earth and other elements. Just as the earth and other elements. Are serviceable in many ways. Are serviceable in many ways. To the infinite number of beings. To the infinite number of beings. Inhabiting limitless space. Inhabiting limitless space. So may I become. So may I become that which maintains all beings. That which maintains all beings. Situated throughout space. Situated throughout space. So long as all have not attained. So long as all have not attained. To peace. To peace. Padme
Padma Siddhi Hong. Om Maho Raja Guru 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 Padma Siddhi Hong. Gate Gate Par Gate. Parasangate Bodhisattva. Parasangate 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 Bodhisattva. Gate Gate Paragate Parasangate Bodhisattva. Gate 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 Paragate Parasangate Bodhisattva Gate Gate Paragate Parasangate Bodhisattva Om Shanti got time for tonight um, yeah, it's been really lovely coming together to once well, best celebrate honor remember Bante thank you all very much